Hello, my name is Veronica Chapman Smith. I am the Vice President of Community Initiatives at Opera Philadelphia. I am a black middle-aged person who wears glasses and has dark brown hair that I'm currently wearing in a high bun. Um, thank you all for joining us today for this lecture, uh, which is the first in a four-part series done in collaboration with the International Florence Price Festival. This series provides a comprehensive exploration of representation in classical music, showcasing the diverse voices that have often been overlooked. Today's lecture, Reshaping the Vocal Canon, Does Representation Matter? will explore the plan, um, sorry, will explore a plan of action to motivate our community to reshape vocal music curriculums, recital programs, and stage productions. This event will be recorded and will be available on the Opera Philadelphia YouTube channel um, later at a later date. Um, as I mentioned, this series is done in collaboration with the International Florence Price Festival. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sidney Rose, the board vice president and director of development for Price Fest, um, who will speak briefly about the International Florence Price Festival and will introduce today our lecturer today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, just to give you a little bit of information about the International Florence Price Festival, we are a, an organization that is dedicated to celebrating the life and the legacy of composer Florence Beatrice Price. And we do so through an annual festival featuring all of Price's musical output, as well as scholarly, educational, and advocacy-oriented events. We are so thrilled to be partnering with Opera Philly and uh, this uh, this season and with all of the events that we have coming up with Opera Philadelphia. And uh, if you would like to learn more about that, those events that we have coming up this year, you can visit our website at www.pricefest.org where you can join our mailing list and follow us on social media as well. Your lecturer today is Dr. Latoya Lane, who is someone I am personally thrilled to be hearing from today. You will find that she is a very brilliant uh, professor who is a native of New Orleans and is an associate professor of voice at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as a member of the Metropolitan Opera Extra Chorus. Dr. Lane's research includes the intensive study and performance practice of Negro spirituals. Welcome, Dr. Lane. Thank you, Dr. DeBose. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So today, I'm going to share my screen first. Today, I wanted to talk to you about a topic um, that we have been discussing for a very long time. And my hope is that we walk away from here with a plan of action and how we can get the ball rolling rather than still having these discussions. Um, I, I was inspired to have this, um, to start doing this research because I was assigning one of my students a spiritual and you could visibly, visibly see how uncomfortable she was. And so it was almost like I had to make sure that I didn't get defensive because I immediately felt like I wanted to defend the art form. Um, and I had to make sure that I remained in teacher mode because this is a young singer who does not know. And that's my role and responsibility is to make sure that she does. So according to Daryl Taylor in his, The Importance of Studying African-American Art Song, he says, if African-American composers are acknowledged at all in such a recital, it's usually via spiritual arrangements. So this manner of programming gives a very distinct impression to audience members, purchasers of recordings, and particularly to young singers beginning to form their ideas about art culture, the African-American contribution to this culture is limited to a style of song that is 300 years old. So while the spiritual is the foundation, why do the contributions of African-American musicians matter in classical music? So what 
question am I trying to answer here? In 2021, Ross Alex wrote an article in the New Yorker entitled, Black Scholars Confront White Supremacy in Classical Music. And in it, he says, the whiteness of classical music is above all an American problem. The racial and ethnic makeup of the canon is hardly surprising given European demographics before the 20th century. But when that tradition was transplanted to the multicultural United States, it blended into the racial hierarchy that had governed the country from its founding. So what is he saying here? He's saying that the underrepresentation of BIPOC composers, women composers in the classical canon is a direct reflection of the biases woven into the fabric of this country. So how does this relate to us? Let's first discuss the university system in America. Ramel Brooks wrote in his dissertation, Disparities in Programming African-American Solo Vocal Music on College Campuses Across the United States. He says, the institutions that trained classical musicians were inherently racist. And many suffer today from the past practices of intentional racial debarment. The explicit biases of the past and the implicit biases of the modern day admission practices continue to permeate throughout music programs in this country. So let's look at some facts. So music education in America was limited to white men. Um, the changing landscape and the culture of the United States and America was a good example of what some might consider or call co-evolution um, and the study of music, particularly in the university system, was limited to white men. So the interest in music education primarily began with the need to create better church musicians. Schools were later established to encourage and develop um, stronger, more professional level choirs. Eventually, the music education moved away from its religious ties and began its development in institutions of higher education. And New England was the birthplace of many of the first musical schools as well as higher education institutions. So by the 19th century, these impulses toward musical education, musical higher education began thriving nationwide. Let's look at this timeline here. So in 1636, Harvard University was founded. In 1833, Boston Academy of Music was the first school of higher musical education established. In 1865, Oberlin establishes the first conservatory of music in the US. And it's important to note that schools like Oberlin, Oberlin pioneered the admittance of blacks, while schools like Duke University didn't admit black students until the 1960s. Backing up in 1837, the first HBCU, Cheney University was founded. The first black graduate from Harvard was in 1911, Richard Greener, almost 300 years after Harvard's founding. In 1872, Rachel Washington was the first black to graduate from New England Conservatory and she was a, a voice major. In 1912, the first black woman to graduate from Yale School of Music was Helen Hagen. And 1918, Nora Douglas Holt was the first Black to earn a master's degree in music composition. And then in 1940, Dr. Oscar Anderson Fuller was the first Black to earn a PhD in music. So it was nearly two centuries from Harvard's founding that any Black student earned a degree from an American college or university as it was believed that Blacks were intellectually incapable of earning a college degree. So why is this higher education timeline important? Emory Stevens and Caroline Helton acknowledge that the United States racial past prohibited the inclusion of African-American music into the classical canon. These authors also affirm that many of those prejudices are still at play within the university system. Many of these institutions thrived on the success and commitment to the institution of slavery. Therefore, there was no interest in educating Blacks in this country. 
many of these universities actually participated financially in the slave trade, namely Harvard and my own university, UNC Chapel Hill, were leaders in this regard. So how would schools of higher education support slavery and discrimination while simultaneously celebrate and include the music of black composers? They didn't, which is why in 2024, we're still having the conversation of why representation in the music curriculum of our schools matters. Romel Brooks said, classical music in America is an extension of the university college system. As most students seeking to train a career in music and classical music particularly, they attend post-secondary institutions to further develop their talents, unlike many European uh, countries. So if in 1833, the first school of higher musical education was founded, and one of the first blacks to graduate with a degree in music wasn't until later in the century, what was happening in the development and the appreciation of American composers of classical music? So it wasn't until 1977 when Aaron Copeland decided there needs to be more American composers featured on orchestral concerts. So 150 years of American composition, where were the black composers? We know of famous black composers like William Grant Steele, but their studies, their works weren't studied and weren't introduced into the college curriculums for centuries. Racially based admittance practices in American colleges and universities and the belief system that blacks were inferior therefore not intellectually capable of composing on an advanced level, or their music was unworthy of performance, their compositions were never received into what we now consider to be the classical music canon. I can appreciate when Paul Patinka said in his representations and vocal repertoire, a lack of representation in itself serves as a form of representation by highlighting social inequalities. The artistic absence of individuals whose stories are not valued by cultural authority structures are noticed implicitly by those in power and explicitly by those who are not. He goes on to say that critical musicologists have most notably questioned assumptions around the traditional musical canon, a repertoire that is considered fundamental to the field. So common microaggressions, as I call them, but those descriptions that are used to invoke the canon's essential nature include words like masterpiece and master composer and the classics and standard repertoire and the standards and great composers. All of these terms were used and the canon is disproportionately comprised of the music of white men understood to be cisgendered and heterosexual. This does not represent the full truth of Western classical music history. It also necessarily ignores the reproductive forces that have perpetuated this system by disenfranchising minority parties from participation. Race, gender, sexuality, or any combination of intersectional identities have been used as limiting criteria for what can enter the vocal canon and what should be excluded. So the question, how do we move beyond this conversation? I want each of us to walk away with this plan of action of implementation that future voice, future generations of voice students can follow. So why is this important? Not long ago, a collection of 27 um, I'm sorry, 27 art song collections, so collections varying in number, but 27 of them only revealed two African-American composers, William Grant Steele and George Walker. So when the compositional output, output of a specific demographic is ignored, there are a few things that take place. Number one, negative preconceived stereotypes about said demographic continue to manifest. Unless we diligently present opportunities to our students, and I'm speaking to not only voice faculty, but people who teach privately as well, and people who are performing actively, who have you know mentees who look up to them, 
Um, unless we present opportunities for our students to learn the compositions of Black composers, there will continue to be implicit bias solely based on lack of exposure. And then these students will become the next generation of voice teachers bound by cultural assumptions. Number two, the promotion of great American poets will go unrecognized. So many African-American composers set the text of black poets as these spoke to the experiences and the perspectives of a people largely ignored. Number three, the vocal canon in many ways teaches students and audiences who is worthy, who is important. Paul Patinka said that educational theorizing and research have linked the success of women and BIPOC to the, their ability to visualize themselves as positive and equal forces in the field. Further research shows that those in the queer community have higher levels of self-esteem and lower rates of depression and suicide when they saw themselves portrayed positively in the media. Functionally, representation matters because it allows cultural minorities to see themselves living as equal valued members of this society. Representation helps to eliminate mental barriers to success and seeks to further ideologies that support inclusion, equity, and ultimately justice. Educational psychologist Abraham Maslow said that self-actualization cannot be fully achieved until an individual's physiological safety, love, belongingness, and esteem needs are met. So if individuals see themselves as outsiders in their field, they may only be able to meet the criteria of fulfilling the first two psychological categories and thereby never fully reach self-actualization. Why is this conversation so uncomfortable? So post-World War II, this country found itself in a place of heightened awareness of racial oppression. Segregation, the outgrowing of counteraction, often violent, of those resisting the evolution of a more inclusive society was very present. This resistance was also rampant within the performing arts. So on the heels of blackface minstrelsy for generations, white performers have not found a sense of ownership. They've not found permission and belonging within the music of black Americans. And I should clarify and say classical music because they didn't have any problem playing jazz. We have all over the world whites who perform hip hop and country and pop music, all of these being derived from black music. So what are we afraid of? In Louise Toppin's lecture on black American music, she compiled a list of some apprehensions that students and voice teachers have when it comes to assigning repertoire of black composers. So there's a fear of appropriation. There's a lack of knowledge of the history their lack of resources, lack of exposure to the repertoire, lack of scores, finding the music, fear of the dialect is a big one, lack of knowledge of performance practices, fear of not creating a meaningful experience, feeling like you need permission, and then fear of uncovering your own biases. Randy Jones wrote in So You Want to Sing Spirituals, A Guide for Performers. She highlighted many of the same apprehensions that white musicians may confront when considering performing spirituals. The first perception addressed is that African-Americans discourage whites from singing spirituals because of the concern that the songs are not given the respect that they deserve. She details how early 19th century blackface minstrels combined American African American folklore, for example, the music, the oral history, the jokes, the beliefs, the stories, the customs, combined it with spirituals to depict African Americans as ignorant, second class citizens, and unworthy of cultural respect. So now here we are in the 21st century 
and the disgrace that's associated with Blackface minstrel shows and their unfortunate link to the music of Black Americans continues to permeate throughout our art form. We see the direct influence of this, oftentimes subconsciously, in the attitudes toward performing songs composed by African-American composers. So where do we as voice teachers and colleagues start? Where do we begin? So when we as teaching artists show interest in something, our students become interested in it. The standard then of the vocal repertoire begins to evolve. The future of African-American art song and performing opera by African-American composers start right here with us. Firstly, we can no longer assign repertoire by Black composers solely to the Black singers or only for Black History Month. I have a lecture recital that I do. It's called um, Narrative of a Slave Woman, Songs of Hope, Justice, and Freedom. And it's based on the slave narratives that were written by the um, a part of the Federal Writers Project of the 1930s. And as I was reading these narratives, I began to you know, hear some of my favorite spirituals. So I decided to recreate a fictional narrative based on these actual events and interweave them with spirituals where I tell the, you know, the story of one formerly enslaved woman through song and spoken narrative. And so I've toured this recital all over the world, Sweden and Nairobi, Kenya, and all over the country at different universities and even at the Nats convention. And I've gotten to the point where I no longer want to accept invitations to do it when the producer's asking me to do it in February. So when they ask me about doing it in February, my first inclination is to say, can we do it in March? Can we do it in November? Because I don't want students and audiences to continue with the idea that black music only belongs in this month. We're trying to reinvent, reshape and reinvigorate the canon. According to the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education nationwide, only 6% of students who earn a bachelor degree in music are black. 6%. So since Black Americans represent a very small percentage of all classical musicians, if we are the only demographic performing music by Black composers, what does that do to the rate of inclusion and representation? The art form will remain stagnant. In order to reinvent, reshape, and reinvigorate the canon, all of us, all races, have to be active participants. For example, many, many believe that spirituals should only be sung and performed by Black singers. Lauren Plant, in Singing African American Spirituals, Reflection on Racial Barriers in Classical Vocal Music said, spirituals are not exclusively written for African Americans to perform, but are written to express the perspective of the African American experience. This gives assurance for non-African Americans to perform spirituals in conjunction with the standard repertoire within the classical canon of vocal music. She argues that singing spirituals can create a pathway to understanding our nation's racial legacy through sharing the joys, the pains and sorrows, emotions that we can all relate to while not painfully forgetting or fearfully ignoring them. You know, when I teach opera workshop, I like to challenge my students to pull emotions from their own experiences in their storytelling. So we've all felt love, we've all felt abandonment, we've all felt fear, et cetera. Um, and just how you recall these emotions when you're singing The Countess, it's gonna be the exact same thing when you present spirituals. So of course, there are opportunities to explore the diction and the dialect, specifically when performing pieces by composers who set poets that were adamant that the dialect be adhered to. Like for example, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, um, who inspired many poets of the Harlem Renaissance. But we must simultaneously remember that the vocal approach to this music is no different than when you're learning German leader. In the research conducted by Emory Stevens and Caroline Helton, they found that faculty in the Deep South demonstrated a general unwillingness to broach the issue of crossing the color barricade within their students' performances. 
This lack of engagement resulted in negative outcomes as the master classes and performances were insufficiently attended, along with students performing pieces that were not race specific. The study identified the role of the instructor in providing a setting where sensitive issues such as race could be explored and discussed. An unwillingness to promote diversity dampened the students' willingness to explore songs that are generally not accepted within the classical canon. However, the opposite um, effect was observed when faculty members prepped and fostered discussions around race and perceptions at some of the other institutions. Their study revealed that the need for faculty training around inclusion and diversity within the arts is paramount. So what's the assignment? What are the steps that you take when learning a new art song, whether it be German leader or French chanson or Italian opera? Think about those steps. You know, the beginning of the semester, I always give my students this sheet. I'm a very, um, you know, I learn stuff by checking it off. I have steps. And a lot of times I find students go in the practice room and they have no idea what to do. They immediately go in the practice room and they just start plucking out notes. So I created this sheet on how to practice and I included some steps that, you know, I was inspired by one of my colleagues um, at a Nats convention. And I found that this sheet kind of helped guide their practice. So one of the first things you do is you look at the historical context of the piece before you even pluck one note. What's the historical context of the piece? The name of the spiritual, is it based on biblical scripture? Are there other arrangements that are based on this same scripture? Who's the composer? What's his background? What's his story? What's his biography? Who is the poet or the librettist? What's their background or their biography? What's the historical context of the piece? When was it written? Was it, was it for a particular event? Was it a part of a commission for a famous singer? What's the historical context? And then you go to text isolation, just as you would in the German leader. Write the text out separately from the score so that the music and the rhythm don't influence it. Look up any words that are unfamiliar to you. Use IPA with the spirituals. Even if it's your native language, use IPA. And then you're gonna memorize that text, text as a monologue and be able to recite it as a poem. And in that point, you can uncover and discover any emotions that you're feeling as you connect and relate to the text. For example, if you, you're singing, sometimes I feel like a motherless child you know what that emotion feels like. Recall that as you're looking at the text separately from the music, write those emotions in the score. And then look at the rhythm, look at meter and tempo changes, look at the text in relationship to the rhythm. Why do you think the composer may have made these choices for this particular word? And then, then do the exact same thing when you look at the accompaniment, when you look at the piano part, where do you hear modality changes and tonal changes? What's the text that's associated with it? Why do you think the composer made those choices? And so on and so forth. It's the exact same thing when you're studying the spiritual. So your approach will look no different. So if we as faculty and as teachers are unwilling to take the lead in this, um, if we are willing to take the lead, the students will follow. I challenge you all to Allow your studio to become a safe space, a place where you can talk about race, about gender, about sexuality, where this can be freely discussed, where the student can feel vulnerable in sharing their experiences, life experiences. Become familiar, you yourselves, with Black composers and their bodies of works by listening to recordings, attending recitals. The internet has made this easy for us. Assign this repertoire as a part of the vocal diet of your studio, not as some special entity. Remind and encourage students to realize that the emotional truths within the poetry are universal. We have all experienced loss, suffering, grief, abandonment, and longing. Recall those emotions and bring them into your storytelling. Teachers, colleagues, Perform this repertoire on your recitals. 
the students will respond. They will sit in the audience and admire, oh, wow, my teacher is programming this rep. Let me learn more about it. Here are some further suggestions by Louise Toppin. She said, let's change the language that is used when discussing the repertoire in the studio, not treating it as if it's the other. Introduce the music as a part of the curriculum, not as an added addendum to the curriculum. Exchange and expand the repertoire by focusing on vocal goals that you wanna accomplish. Reflect on the richness of your offering, not on what is being left out. Require a certain number of African-American or African diaspora composers in your studio repertoire assignments along with women and living composers. Add an audition requirement to include a song by an African-American composer for your schools of music or your departments. You could initiate an in-studio research project or do a studio recital focused on these composers and poets and not during February. <laughs> Make a commitment to include these works of art songs in your classes and other academic courses. Have conversations with your musicology faculty about including these composers on their syllabi. Bring in guests regularly to work with your students on this repertoire in master classes and residencies. And then partner with other organizations to present this music. So our relationship to the issues of race and gender and ethnicity is a troubled one in this country. But yet the opportunity for evolution is to a more inclusive direction is here and in this moment and with everybody that's on this webinar. Those among us who may not have spent a considerable amount of time reflecting on this, um, on the things that we've discussed, because in many ways it doesn't directly affect you, you still have a responsibility to arm yourselves with wisdom and knowledge. And that responsibility is to your colleagues and to your students, particularly your students of color. Rethinking the ways in which we assign music is a critical step to reshaping the vocal music canon to be more diverse and more inclusive. It may be an uncomfortable conversation to repeatedly have, but until we pursue it head first, there will be no change and we will still be having this conversation. We today have an opportunity to rewrite the norm. The Nats organization has done a wonderful job of redefining and embracing this ever evolving canon within the student auditions, including the Hall Johnson category, and also expanding the requirements for um, the repertoire that students can present in the Nats auditions. So not only during Black History Month or when we're celebrating Pride or you know, International Women's Day, but the support won't stop there. This needs to be done by all of us year round. So we're gonna let go of fear. We're gonna let go of guilt. We're gonna let go of whatever was and walk into whatever is. We need to make representation intentional. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Lane. That was inspiring and wonderful. I feel like I've walked away with my own actions, items, and steps um, to bring into Opera Philadelphia's practice of inclusion um, and community building. Um, we wanted to give a moment um, and hold space for anybody who had any questions uh, for Dr. Lane. Uh, you can feel free to unmute yourself, put them in the chat. If you have questions about the International Florence Price Festival organization, you can ask Dr. Sequina to pose. Um, we are here to answer any questions. One of the things I noticed um, with the particular student that I was inspired um, is she was afraid to say how she really felt. Um, because she could be judged. And implicit bias is common with all of us. We all have some form of biases, especially when we're dealing with racism in this country. So that's one of the things that I would encourage us to have a conversation with our students. Don't be afraid to, to say what you may have been thinking or why you're fearful of this repertoire. 
or you know, one of the things I asked her, I said, do you think your friends, when you perform this in voice area recital, that people are gonna judge you for singing it? And it kind of, you know, sparked a new conversation about that because that was one of the reasons. So I just wanted to add, you know, to encourage them to not be afraid to share that and let them know that, you know, it's, it's a judgment-free zone and that we can have this conversation openly. I think that also kind of speaks to um, the importance of representation um, at the higher ed level in terms of faculty, yes. right? Because- yes part of the reason why she felt more comfortable was because she felt like she was really giving, being given permission from someone who is taking part in that culture and community, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens with our white faculty who don't feel like they have the permission to give or the authority, you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, we I do see. have that. Yeah. You got it, you got it. So Queen, go ahead. <laughs> I see in the chat um, that you've been asked can you share biblio, biblio, bibliography of sources? Yeah, um, you know what? A lot of the articles that I quoted, um, the Natch Journal, I, I use the Natch Journal a lot. Also, um, of course, like I said, Randy Jones's So You Want to Sing Spirituals were very helpful. One of my favorite books, I think I have it. Um, it might be in my car. You know, we keep stuff in the car. But it's um, Eileen Gunther's um history of spiritual and performance practice is the, the text that I use for my class. Mm -hmm. Great, and we can include that uh, list of books and journals in the posting for, that we put on YouTube so that you'll have access to those titles. I wonder if you might speak also to ways to um, maybe incorporate, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this from a level of standardized tests. Mm. We all have to do exit exams for degrees and uh, for, for various programs. And I'm wondering, might that be a way to try to reinvigorate the canon or to allow there to be more um, interest in and valid validity given to this repertoire and these composers if they are included in the materials that students have to study in order to pass their exams, mm -hmm. right? Is one thing, it needs to be incorporated throughout the semester, but oftentimes what teachers end up doing is they end up, it seems like they end up formulating the curriculum around what they know the students will need for their, mm -hmm. for their exams. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. You know, I brought this up in a faculty meeting um, we have to get in uh, tandem with the musicology professors because mm -hmm. they're the ones writing those questions. Right. So until our music history faculty get on board, we'll still be having this conversation. So I would encourage us, um, I don't know, maybe one-on-one -on -one conversations rather than, you know, talking in the group because people get defensive. And, you know, one of the things I love that we're doing at UNC is we've kind of totally revamped our curriculum to be more inclusive. And one of the ways is we don't just offer Western music theory because other cultures have other ways of identifying and notating music. So now we have other ways to notate and listen to and describe music class. And I love that. So we're really open and I think this will be a great opportunity for me and I'm putting this responsibility on myself to have this conversation with my colleagues. Um, since we're being so you know, inclusive, here's another opportunity as you're writing these qualifying exams to make sure that we're representing BIPOC and women composers. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my charge for myself and for all of us to have these conversations with our music, uh, music history faculty. Awesome. Can you talk a little bit about the anti-Blackness present around gospel singing in academia as well as vocal music teaching in general? Oh yeah. You know, people are afraid of what they don't understand. <laughs> That's my first response to that. Um, you know, if, when you go back to look at the institution of slavery, Black people weren't allowed to have their own church. They had to, um, go to their master's churches and they would sit up in the balcony um, in their section and mostly listen to sermons about, you know, what it meant to be a good slave. But 
they didn't have the opportunity to worship freely, um, but they did anyway. They would sneak in each other's cabins at night and, and have their own church. And so because it had to be in secret, the appreciation and the understanding of it is inherent centuries later. And when, you know, a white person may witness gospel singing, what they hear doesn't feel natural to them because they've not witnessed it or been around it or been exposed to it, especially in these small towns. I mean, it's like, you know, in North Carolina, some of these kids come from places where there are no black people. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is eliminating the fear of the unknown and stuff that you have not been exposed to, to be more open to it and understand that the gospel singing and the, the way that you produce sound is just another genre and another tool that's used to tell the stories. Um, let's see, spirituals can be more accepted and as good singing in very musical music while gospel can be more taboo. Yeah, I think it's associated with the spirituality of black people mm. and the fear of it and the way we use our voices to communicate those stories. That's valid. Yeah. Yeah, one of the reasons why, um, well, the, this partnership between um, the International Florence Price Festival and Opera Philadelphia is part of an initiative that we're calling the Pro the Price Pledge, mm. and we came up with the 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 idea that we needed to put some accountability measures in place mm -hmm. for arts organizations and for academic institutions that we partner with, because oftentimes what ends up happening is, like you said, the February Black History Month event thing happens, mm -hmm. or um, it becomes like these one-off events. And then we did it and we check it off the list and it's done. The check. You know? I talk about that all the time. <laughs> and and, the, and the, it really kind of came to us as something that we needed to do because we had someone uh, comment at the end of an event and tell us that, um, you know, have you thought of trying to get Price's music included on the required repertoire list for piano competitions? Because my students in my studio all have to do a certain number of competitions every year. And whenever you go into these piano competitions, some of them have listed repertoire that the students are required to submit as, as one of the pieces that they will compete with. And I never see Price's music on that list. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the things that really started us thinking about the institutions and the organizations that really have an influence um, on, on the canon and on the field. And Opera Philadelphia is, is really leading the charge with this, with this lecture series. So we are so grateful to have you, Dr. Lane. There's another question here. Yes. Oh, I, I wanted to add to that. One of my piano colleagues called me one day. Um, she was invited to do a recital at what used to be a plantation, not far mm -hmm. from Chapel Hill. And she was like, LaToya, I feel uncomfortable presenting this recital without acknowledging the ground that we stand on. Mm -hmm. One of my Asian colleagues, yeah. how can I, how can I address this without, um, you know, what's a great way to address it, address it. And I said, perform black composers and yeah. then do program notes or say a speech about it. And she played one of Price's um, piano pieces and she gave a, you know, a little speech before it. And that gave her the opportunity to acknowledge the ground they were sitting on and yeah. also to highlight how intricately um, challenging and technically advanced Florence Price's piano pieces were and are. Mm -hmm. So yes. Phenomenal, that's a great example. Mm-hmm. There's a question, uh, how would you recommend to someone like me, a white singer, going about honoring and acknowledging the history and context of, for example, spirituals amongst the performance of art song repertoire of a composer like Florence Price? Mm -hmm. There's an example right there. <laughs> yep, that was the example. That was it. That answer. Having that great question. program notes, or if you feel comfortable speaking before, if you were doing a set of... Um, spirituals or, or art song by black composers having an opportunity to to speak about it before you do and don't be afraid to have the conversation you know sometimes people feel like they need to be the authority or be an expert no just like i'm not an expert on you know italian opera or french art song i mean you know i research my piece and then i can talk about it 
and it'll and treat it the same way. I want people to stop othering it the same way we, I mean, literally we spend all day with other culture, yeah. with other music. Like our libraries are full of foreign language, Correct. but we're more comfortable with that than stuff that was grown and cultivated right here in our own country. So just approach it as if it's not an other, but it's a part of American culture and I'm American. That's right. Um, another person commented, as a pianist, I never heard of Price until I began working with singers. I believe it, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's why, you know, if you serve on the board of an organization or you're a member of an organization that's hosting these competitions or these events, and, you know, we can all do our part to spread the word about composers like Price and living composers mm -hmm. um, who are, you know, coming from diverse backgrounds. Here's a question. This question came through via the Q&A functionality. It says, what advice would you give to students of predominantly white institutions who have performed spirituals or works of black composers not received well by other blacks? Mm -hmm and maybe discouraged of, uh, from performing black works in the future? Very good question. You know, my, when we did, you know, we've all done Porgy and Bess a, a million times. And my parents have seen it each time that I've been at it. But my mom didn't share with me until we did it at the Met, how she felt about it. Mm -hmm. And you know, you look in the audience, the Porgy and Bess audience, and you hardly, see black people because it reminds us of something that we don't want to remember. Mm. And when she said that, I was like, I didn't even think, you know, I think about the music and how moving and intricate, you know, all of those things, but I didn't consider our parents' generation and older, what it feels like to see 1940s represented on the stage and how that's triggering. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I wanted to mention that, but then also there will be people who don't receive it. Um, but I think about Mr. Rogers and he said, he used to always say, um, look for the helpers. There will be people who don't receive it, but there are going to be people who do lean into those people. And hopefully the people who don't receive it or who may have a negative opinion about it will educate themselves because that's all it is, is a, a lack of education. Because like I said, you know, we represent such a small amount of the, the small number of musicians that are performing professionally. If we're the only ones that do it, there are students who will never hear a spiritual because there are no black people on their faculty. That's not okay. Hmm. Somebody has to do this repertoire at your school. So number one, hire more black people. And number two, white colleagues assign the repertoire. Don't be afraid of it. So yeah, look for the helpers. <laughs> look for the people that's gonna encourage you. But will this video be made available for people to share this lecture? Is there a uh, way for Yes, absolutely. To It'll be listed on the Upper Philadelphia channel um, and you'll be able to have a, a shareable link as because it's on our YouTube channel. So it'll be free and available to the public. Share awesome. this link with mm -hmm. your professors <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and <Right>. administrators. <laughs> Right. And board members and, board. And, and colleagues. Come on, North Carolina, them trustees. <laughs> <laughs> Look for the helpers. That That's the, the quote. Yeah, yep. it is the word for, uh, yeah, I'm going to take that with me and, uh, I always try to look for the helpers. That's the only way we're going to get anything done together is to find the people who are, are, are doing the work that you want to be doing and join them because yeah. together we can make a difference. Um, I wanted to just, uh, bring to our attention that we have about five minutes left that we've allocated for this uh, talk. If you would like to uh, ask another question, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Lane for this insightful lecture. It was fantastic. Um, I want to remind people that we have, this is a series. Uh, this is one in four. Our next uh, lecture will be next Thursday. Hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.